Bible Answers with Dr. Al Garza. All right, welcome back to another edition of Bible Answers Unfiltered, and I am your host, Dr. Al Garza. So I've been getting recently a number of different emails and messages regarding uh, the debate that Dr. White did with not only Leighton Flowers, but with Jason Breda. Now, the debate with Jason Breda has dealt with uh, the limited atonement, uh, Hebrews 7.25, in a, in, a, in a different, broader scale of atonement. And so I've been getting some messages in, re, in, in reference to if Dr. White uh, followed proper exegesis with, with Jason, and if what uh, White says with the Greek follows, and, and, and how he created another video, which we're going to look at here, a post-debate of, of why he asked Jason to interpret Hebrews 7.25 exegetically. Now, Dr. White is known for reading the text from the Greek and then giving his interpretation. He did that in his post-debate with Dr. Flowers, and even in the debate, all he did was read uh, from John 6 and give his interpretation with a little bit of Greek in there. Now, he did this very similar thing with Jason here. Uh, when it came to Q&A, he formulated a question about Hebrews 7.25 that Jason commented that he wasn't going to do that and, and give uh, his, his, his view on it because he would have to do proper exegesis, and that would take time. And that is true. Uh, and now, he could have given a, a very general comment, but I think Dr. White would have kept pressing him on it regardless. But Dr. White himself uh, doesn't always follow proper exegesis when it comes to Reformed Calvinistic theology and these verses. You're only going to find these interpretations of these passages like Hebrews 7.25, John 6, Romans 8, Philippians, uh, Ephesians 1, only within Reformed Calvinism itself. If you, if you do actual academic uh, research and do actual textual criticism and look and do biblical exegesis, hermeneutics, and you take the time, you will not come to these interpretations. And we're going to do that today. I'm going to give you, uh, we're going to look, listen to Dr. White and we're going to look at everything he says uh, and, and pinpoint where he's, he doesn't, he gets it wrong. Uh, and he's not following proper exegesis and interpretation. He's actually just, he's just, well, proper exegesis and hermeneutics, he's actually giving his own reform interpretation into the text. Now, when you do proper exegesis and hermeneutics, and basically exegesis, there's a number of things you got to do. When you come to a text in the Bible, a verse or a chapter, whatever it is, you have to look at first the historical context. Understand its historical background of the text. Consider the time period, the culture context, authorship, intended audience, any relevant historical events leading up to that. We look at literary context, and that, that is analyzing the text within the context of the larger work. You consider the theme, motif, narrative, structure, and stylistic elements of the text. We're going to look at language and translation of the text if the text has been translated from its original language. Study the nuances of the original language and how it may, they may, di, uh, may affect the interpretation. And of course, consulting multiple translations for clarity. We also look at genre analysis. Uh, we have to consider if this genre is narrative, is it poetry, prophecy, uh, understand the con uh, conventions of the, of the literary devices associated within the genre. Uh, then we got to get into textual analysis. We break down the text into smaller units, as in verses or paragraphs, and of course, analyze each unit individually. Pay attention to key words and phrases and rhetorical devices that is used by the author. Uh, then we get into contextual analysis. So we have textual and now contextual analysis. And we consider how the text relates to its surrounding context within the larger work. And we look for connections uh, between different parts of the text and how they contribute to the overall meaning. Then we look at interpretation. And we formulate interpretations of the text based on your analysis of its historical, literary, and textual context and everything I just listed. And of course, when we do that, we consider different possible meanings and interpretations, which Dr. White doesn't do. And textual, look at textual context, consider different possible meanings and interpretations, and evaluate them based on evidence from the text and scholarly research. Again, something White does not do. He doesn't consult scholarly resources, and he doesn't cite them. And of course, we can look at, uh, compare with commentaries. We consult scholarly commentaries, okay, scholarly commentaries and interpretation of the text to gain insight from experts in the field. And we compare your own interpretation with those of others and consider different perspectives. Again, something White does not do. And of course, then we document all that. 
Now, I just gave you a list of what, what is considered improper exegesis. Now, we're going to look at this video, and we're going to determine, did, White, did Dr. White follow any of this? And we're going to analyze his own understanding of the Greek here. And does his interpretation based on the Greek lead him to his interpretation? And this is mainly a Reformed Calvinistic interpretation, so we need to look at that itself. So I'm going to play the video, and I'll, I'll stop on some highlight portions here, and then we'll go from, from there. But let's, let's start with Dr. White and how he looks at this. <clears throat> but verse 25 is what I was focusing on. Um, hence, he is able, sozine ice ta panteles dunatai. He is able to save a particular group. The ones drawing near through him to God. In that he's always living zone Ice taught with an infinitive. Um, very common in Paul. Um, I don't think that this particular, you know, you know, my theory is Paul preached this in Hebrew and Luke wrote it down in Greek. <clears throat> Ice taught with the infinitive. <clears throat> Why is he able to save forever or to the uttermost? Because he ever lives to make intercession who pair altone. I'm sorry, I left that up there. Who pair altone for them. So the intercession is for a specific people. It is not universal. I would argue that the intercession of the high priest is identical to the audience of the sacrifice that the high priest performed. And if, you, if you're going to say that the high priest intercedes for a different group than those for whom the sacrifice is made, then you have to prove that. You can't just assert it. You've got to prove it. I've never seen anybody even try. So I'll stop there and I'll kind of comment. <clears throat> Dr. White makes this challenge. Um... Of, of asserting, of proving it, of how the text is supposed to read, uh, speaking of just a particular group. Now, he, he interprets, as if you notice, he says a, partic a peculiar group of people. Now, he makes this comment even in his book, The Potter's Freedom, which I do have, and he makes this same assertion with a particular group uh, in this book. Now, he starts off with this interpretation on page 239 of his book, The Potter's Freedom, and on page 240, he says, of course, like he says here, that he is able to save a particular people or a group, as he states, those who draw near to God through him, which again, he, he cites. So his particular group, and he, he references Romans 8.34 here, his particular group is the elect. That's what he's inserting into the text. And he'll say that later on. This is regarding the elect. Now, it doesn't say elect, obviously. That's his interpretation. That's what he's getting from it. Now, I'm going to comment a little bit more on this, but I want to. He, he makes a challenge here. He, he see nobody talk about this about being for other than the people of Israel and all these things. Now, I'm not arguing that Paul is specifically referencing. Uh, he, what he that Paul is speaking here about all nations or everybody. But do we have examples? that Dr. White say suppose he doesn't exist and he's never seen anybody anybody confirm this. Is there examples of this regarding uh, the high priest or the priest in, within Israel, <clears throat> within Judaism, giving, you know, uh, this type of uh, this type of pleading or of course as the text is intercession for others other than his people. And we find this <clears throat> some of Philo's work. Now, <clears throat> if you go to uh, Ellingsworth, uh, Ellingworth, Elling, Ellingworth's uh, work on this, Paul, the Epistle to the Hebrews, which is extensive academic work. Uh, he references also uh, this notion from the text, uh, and he references Philo, or he t he basically mentions Philo that you know Philo says so and so. Now I looked up the works of Philo. I looked at uh, the Life of Moses from Philo. I looked up the Special Laws, Book Two of Philo. And I also examined. Uh, uh, Philo on Abraham, 
uh, as well as another work that he did. I think I only looked at three. But in this work, uh, in Philo, The Life of Moses, on section 149, Philo says, ref referring to, it seemed good to the ruler and the governor of the universe to re recompense him, referring back to Moses, with a sovereign, sovereign authority over a more populous and more powerful nation, which he was about to make to himself out of all the other nations and, and dedicate to the priesthood, uh, that it might forever offer up prayers for the whole universal race of mankind for the sake of averting evil from them and procuring them from participate in, procuring them a participation in blessings. So again, this was a priestly uh, uh, blessing and so forth uh, of all the nations and the, all the race of mankind, the whole universal race of mankind. Um, given by the priest, and, and this is from the life of Moses. You can look at this in section 149. Uh, so again, stating that this was on behalf of all human race, universe, in this particular way. And in summary, uh, Philo describes Moses' decision to leave his privileged position in Egypt, uh, where he could get it, where he could have enjoyed uh, in significant authority, and so forth. But Moses made his choice due to his moral convictions and deep-seated aversion to the, to the injustice occurring in Egypt. As a reward for his integrity and high stance, the divine ruler and governor of the universe granted Moses, uh, which, is, which is basically speaking of God, leadership over more populous and more powerful nation, Israel. This nation was chosen from among all others to serve a unique priestly role dedicated to interceding on behalf of all humanity. Through their prayers, they would seek to deflect evil and secure blessings for all people, reflecting a universal concern for the well-being of every human being. So that was that point. Now, I'm not saying Paul is referencing that here or saying anything similar. I'm saying there is outside sources from Philo that talk about priestly blessings and, and intercession for people outside of Israel, not part of that special group or what White calls the elect. And Philo Special Laws too. Uh, we have another uh, reference here. And again, these are just sources. Dr. White says he's challenging. So on 167 in uh, Philo Special Laws 2, 163 to 167, part of 63 says, the reason is that the priest has, to, has the same relation to the city that the nation the Jews has to the entire inhabited world. And then he goes on to say in 6 7, For this reason, it amazes me that some dare to charge the nation with an antisocial stance, a nation which has made such an extensive use of fellowship and goodwill toward all people everywhere, and that they offer up prayers and feasts and first fruits on behalf, on behalf of the common race of human beings, and to serve the really self existent God both on behalf of themselves and others who have run for them services and run from the services which they should have rendered. So again, these are prayers and feasts and first fruits uh, for all of human race and all human beings. So again, Philo defends the Jewish nation against accusations, arguing that their dedication to the worship of the one true God and their prayers and offerings are for the welfare of all humanity and demonstrates profound community of fellowship within the good fellowship within the goodwill. Again, I'm reading it fast. I apologize, but the point was there is precedence in outside works of Philo, which is written in Greek. Uh, and, you, and if you don't know Greek, they have it in English translation where you can see that the, the, the priest gave blessings and first fruits and offerings not to and behalf of all humanity, everyone. Uh, now this text is really dealing with eternal life. So that's not what Paul is saying, but part of the a challenge here is that you can find outside work regarding the priest giving uh, certain uh, blessings and feasts and first and all that references, but even by file that this was done on their behalf. And in Philo on Abraham, uh, on, in section 98, this nation, referring to Israel, steaming from the marriage and characterized by Philo. Uh, oh, that's a summary. Sorry. Let me read it. It says Philo. Uh, where is the section at here? Um, I presume. Uh, well, the, this, the, the part in Philo in, in 98 uh, is dealing with uh, the one which appears to me uh, priesthood. Yeah. So it says... In section a marriage which however was not intended to produce any limited number of sons and daughters the most the the most god loving of all nations and one which appears to me to have received the offices of priesthood and prophecy on behalf of the whole human race so the section deals with uh uh philo comments on the 
preservation of the woman's chastity and highlights God's role in honoring the piety and virtue of her husband. Then God rewards the husband with a marriage, with a marriage and remains untouched by harm and or disrespect. Uh, and then Philo notes, it's not just for procreating a limited number of children, but as seen as a foundation for the nation deeply devoted by God. This nation, steaming from the marriage, is characterized by Philo as assuming the role of priests and prophets for humanity, serving as a spiritual moral guide for the whole human race. So we do have outside works that talk about them giving these types of blessings and things for different reasons, first fruits and all this, mainly for everyone, all humanity, all human race. As we do as Christians, we pray for our governments and the world and all of those things. Um, it is well documented. Now this text here that Dr. White mentions, uh, and he's in a diagram with a group with an infinitive verb, had, which again does not really, uh, as I said in my other videos, the Greek does not give him his interpretation. It just doesn't. And we're going to look at this again, what he says in regards to this, because he seems to assume it does. And if you really consider the truth of it, it does not. So I'm going to say this straight out. Uh, from, and I'm going to give you a, the heads up on this. From the Greek language, and of course, in Hebrews 7, 23, it is inclusive and action-oriented, okay? It's focusing on a continual act of approaching God through Jesus, all right, so the interpretive question of whether this action is available to all or only a specific group, like the elect, that Dr. White says, is determined more from a theological position rather than the language itself. All right, the Greek text emphasizes the action and its means, which is through Jesus, without explicitly limiting the scope of who can undertake this action. That's just a fact. And as Dr. White points out, the phrase, the ones coming to God through him, from a purely linguistic standpoint, the Greek describes an action rather than a specific predefined group. The Greek does not give you that. The construction focuses on the action of coming or approaching God through Jesus and does not linguistically limit this action to a predetermined group such as the elect in the sense of some theological framework that must be suggested or eisegetically put in. All right, those are my conclusions we're going to get into. So when we look at this from the Greek... All right, and, and the Greek, Hothon Kai Sozain, Ice to Panteles Dunatai, Tos Proskamenos de Atu To Theo, Pantot Zon Ice to Integunamen Uper Aton. Therefore, he, Jesus, is able to save completely the ones who come to God. Through him, referring to Jesus, since he, Jesus, always lives to make intercession or pleading for them. Who? Who's them? The ones who come to God through Jesus. There is nothing in this text to imply elect. And there's not even, a, and, and in complete uh, open transparency, it, it doesn't, transparency, it doesn't say how they're coming to God, whether they're part of an elect group that God has to move directly, or if they're coming on their own uh, free will. To. Now, it doesn't say that in either case. There's no defense for either side here. So what Dr. Y is going to uh, assume is his position into the text, uh, which is a type of presupposition that doesn't exist there, grammatically or exegetically, from the text, linguistically, nothing. Uh, but I want to bring up that first challenge because we do have in the work of Philo, uh, this whole uh, high priest who would do those things. Uh, so if Dr. White wants to check those, he can. But let's continue with what Dr. White says. <clears throat> so my question that I ask so you here, you know, I understand cross-examination, debates are moving along, good clip. Um, you have to think on your feet. You, you've got to hear what's being said. You sort of have to be anticipating. And you've got to know the subject well enough to know that where the questions are coming from. But this is a verse. He uh, <coughs> he went after John Owen, accused him of eisegesis. <coughs> I've had to disagree with John Owen on a few points, but man, you do so with fear and trepidation if you know what you're doing. And I have no reason to believe. All due respect, Jason Brett is a nice guy. He can't read Greek. He does not know the language. And he has documented 
his less than first semester understanding of fundamentally basic things that John Owen knew when he was a teenager. Okay? So he's got no ground at all to be accusing or to even substantiate an accusation against Owen. Anyway, <clears throat> so here is the question. You heard me you heard, heard me say. Verse 25, he is able to save Pontellus forever to the uttermost. What's the relationship between Christ's intercession? And you'll you'll notice this is verse 25 over here. This is a sentence diagram, not my sentence diagram. Um, I'll just put myself down in the little corner down there. Um, it might help if I did. Yeah, now we don't have that in the way. <clears throat> so I'm down in the corner now, and, that's, and I'm little teeny tiny down there, and that's fine. Here are the, this, this, these sentence diagrams are, I don't, I didn't do these. Okay? Um, so don't, don't try to say, oh, you just did that so that supports your position no this is this is a resource you can purchase in accordance it's in, you can buy it in logos um in a number of different resources and not every sentence diagram is going to end up being identical because there are interpretive elements in it but this is somebody else's <clears throat> and most people can't read sentence diagrams and i can assure you that jason breda cannot read this sentence diagram either um Again, you say, you're being just, no. We go back and listen to the hours we did where he's saying, the Greek proves Calvinism wrong. And it's like, no, you don't know Greek and you're wrong about what you're saying and you're confused about the subjunctive and you don't know what a present tense verb is and there's just all sorts. Real quickly, uh, there's no subjunctive verb here. Uh, I'm not sure what White is referring to. So that one part, there is no subjunctive. Infinitive, yes, um, but not no. There is no subjunctive, so I'm not sure what he's referring to here. Sorts of stuff here. Um, <clears throat> here is verse 25, <clears throat> and I wish we still taught this stuff in school. Um, I hope all you hom homeschooling moms and stuff are teaching your kids to sentence sentence diagram because they may hate it now, but they will thank you at a time in the future. So I want to mention one thing here real quickly is before we get into this, and I have this sentence diagram in front of me, I have accordance. Uh, I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars for all these different softwares of Hebrew and Greek in the accordance. So I have all this, and I, of course, I, I printed it out, and I looked at the diagram, and we're going to look at this, how it does not at all relate to anything Dr. White is saying um, or give him the interpretation he thinks. But I want to give you a little bit of background here. With, when, we, when we look at the book of Hebrews here real quickly, we see that uh, Paul is writing to Jewish believers who are continual to offer sacrifice and sin offering through the high priest, uh, going thinking they're going directly to God. But they're using the high priest as, as a mediator instead of relying strictly on Jesus. So Paul is giving a correction here. He's uh, giving a correction and substantiating who Jesus is as the eternal high priest who's always giving intercession intercession for believers specifically them jewish believers and in really all believers by the way uh and so the background is jews for some reason now we can speculate that maybe jews were they want to get persecuted because you got to remember during that time if you're not offering giving offerings for atonement for for sin what would the jewish community look how would they look at you how would they, you know, see you as and say to you saying, you know, are you now sinless? Are you perfect? Uh, why aren't you offering, you know, offerings up? So this is simple to understand that they might have been, you know, probably uh, guilted into doing it or, or, you know, or somehow convinced that you need to still give offerings to God through the high priest. Because remember, you have to go through the high priest and he is your, he is the one who's now your mediator between you and God. Now, Jesus is our final high priest, eternal high priest. He is the only mediator between God and man. And so, therefore, you don't need to go to the high priest anymore. And this falls, you know, with all the unbelieving Jews there and, and the leadership and, and the Pharisees, Sadducees, of course, you're going to see probably why they would have continued to go back to doing this. And Paul is saying, you, you don't understand this, that is not needed anymore. 
There's different types, of course, obviously, uh, sin offering. You have also the yearly observation, Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. But a sin offering was required when an individual unintentionally violated one of God's commandments or committed sin against the community. You find this in Leviticus 4, 2. Now, I took a lot of notes here, so I'm going to kind of go through my notes real quickly about atonement. Uh, but you, it has to be made. The person has to come to bring the offering. Okay, this is something I think the Calvinists don't consider when it comes to atonement. So it's required of an individual who violated one of the God's commandments or committed sin against community. If they've realized they sinned, they were obligated to bring a sin offering to the tabernacle or later known as a temple and present it to the priest. And the procedure for their off the sin offering, the procedure typically involved bringing a specific animal, such as a goat or a lamb, to the entrance of the tabernacle or the temple in this case. You find this in Leviticus 4, 27 through 29. The person seeking atonement would then lay their hands on the head of an animal, symbolically transferring their guilt to it, and the animal would be slaughtered, Leviticus 4, 29. The animal's blood would be sprinkled on the altar, symbolizing purification and atonement for the individual's sin, Leviticus 4, 30. And then failure to bring a required sin offering could result in the individual bearing the guilt of their sin, potentially leading to spiritual consequences, and of course, being in, uh, removed from the community and then facing God's judgment. So if you didn't bring it, it's laid on you. You're the one who's going to take the sin, the guilt sin on yourself and be judged either by the community or by God. So again, this is something that has to be done by the individual. They have to bring the offering. Okay, this isn't as the reform position. The high priest doesn't just, you know, pick and choose how they want. You bring, you don't bring. You bring, I'll accept yours, but not yours. You know, I, and for whatever reason, he, he passes over others and doesn't allow it. That's not what goes on when a high priest. So the Calvinist understanding of limited atonement is completely nonsense. It's not limited. It's only limited to the fact that if you don't bring the atonement yourself or you don't bring the offering for atonement. The priest is not picking and choosing who could bring and who cannot bring as you know, the Calvinists want to think that God can select few and overpass few. It doesn't happen that way. But then you also have what we call free will offering, which is more of a voluntary expression of devotion and gratitude to God, which you find in Leviticus 22, verse 23. And people would bring a free will offering as an act of worship or thanksgiving uh, or seeking favor from God. Uh, and they bring it to the temple or to, and to the high priest and, and offer on behalf of, an, of the individual. So it could be livestock, grain, or other produce, money, uh, depending on the individual's means. You find this in Leviticus 22, verses 18 through 21. So it wasn't mandatory free will, but they were considered uh, essential in demonstrating the faithfulness and devotion of God. So when Paul talks about in Hebrews gifts, offerings, or gifts, I think he's talking about free will offerings here because he talks about it in, in you know Hebrews 8 as well. Uh, how thy priest, uh, you know, offers certain gifts and, and different offerings uh, for sin. So that I believe the gifts could be that for that way. Uh, but you got to have a recognition of sin on the behalf. The person seeking forgiveness, he begins with recognizing their sin, acknowledging that they need reconciliation with God, and then of course demonstrating it by, of course, repent and turning away from the wrongdoing, selecting a specific offering for that bringing the offering to the temple. Uh, and of course, uh, in sin offering, the, the individual seeking forgiveness will lay their hands on the head of the animal. And of course, symbolically transferring it. Uh, and then of course, uh, this, this is a personal responsibility for the sin and the desire for atonement from the individual. And then of course, the sacrifice and atonement will be made. So after they lay their hands, the animal will be slaughtered by the priest. The blood and sacrifice placed a uh, played the crucial role of atonement, symbolized the life of, of, of the animal, uh, given as a substitute for the life of the sinner. So the animal is taking your place. In Leviticus 17, verse 11, the blood would be sprinkled on the altar, representing its purification. Now we know from Hebrews that it doesn't really take away sin, but this is a symbolic act, that the person bringing it wants to be reconciled with God. They want sins forgiven. They want atonement. So they, they put their hands on there. The animal gets slaughtered. They take your place of, of death, and then, of course, it's sprinkled, and the high priest does all that, and then, of course, you're reconciled, confession of sin. The individual would confess their sins before God and the priest, uh, seeking forgiveness and demonstrating genuine repentance, Leviticus 5.5. 5. Uh, and it, it involved open acknowledgement and wrongdoing and expressing remorse of the sin committed. That's the other part, again, Leviticus 5. 
Verse 5. The acceptance of the atonement, upon completing the conf- offering and confession, the individual could trust God's promise of forgiveness and restoration. The atoning sacrifice provides a means for reconciliation between the individual and God, restoring the relationship, enabling them to experience the, uh, the mercy of, and the grace of God. So, again, to summarize, the offering was essential for forgiveness in the Old Testament context because it symbolized the individual's acknowledgement of their wrongdoing, their desire for reconciliation with God, and their trust in the atoning sacrifice provided by God's grace. Through the prescribed rituals of offerings, identification, sacrifice, and confession, individuals can seek forgiveness and restoration with God, experiencing the assurance of His mercy and God, His mercy and grace. So that is the general idea well, and I know I went fast here, but that's how it's understood when they, in, in Hebrews, when they were still doing these things, okay, that I just described. They were continuing to do these things. And rather than relying on Jesus as being the high priest, eternal high priest, that you don't need to bring this, he gave his life and sacrifice for sins forever to be remembered no more, as you're going to see in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, and how these offerings do not remove sin. It is only through Jesus that you can come through the Father and not the high priest. So no more going to the high priest. You go directly to Jesus, your eternal high priest in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, who will for, make intercession for you in a way, not not literally, but in a way that it's done, it's complete, it's daily removed. You come to him and that's it. No more high priest. But what they're doing is in the Hebrews that they were still going to the high priest. So they were kind of going around Jesus to the high priest and continuing. And Paul is saying, no, that, that is not what you do. So when we get to this passage here, understanding the background, the context I just gave you, which is proper exegesis, by the way, with everything I just gave you, you go to verse 25, therefore he, Jesus, if you look at who's the eternal high priest, is able to save completely the ones who come to God through him. Who are the ones coming through God? Well, in the context, these were believing Jews still going to the high priest. You go through Jesus, the ones who come to God through him, since he lives, always lives, lives forever to make intercession for the ones who come to him. This is a declaration, a sense of saying, you know, no more high priest. The ones who come to God through him, they're the ones who are going to have eternal, uh, you know, intercession uh, eternal um, pleading for Jesus to the Father on your behalf, it's no longer through the high priest. That's all it's saying here. The ones coming, as I said earlier, it does not determine uh, either way how the group or the ones coming, it, 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 how they're coming. Is it through a special power like the Refor- Reformers believe or is it through their, their free will? Now, I, I just laid out the Old Testament that if you look at how it's done and how it was done during that time, Second Temple period, uh, it was done by your free, we, we say free will, but by your choice to bring it, recognizing your sin, and all, you have to have all that, which is not how the Calvinists understand atonement because you have to first do all that, recognize you sin, you want reconciliation with God, you do all these things I just listed, and you bring it to the priest, go through all that, and then the priest is a mediator between you and God, does all the stuff he does, and then you're forgiven. And you do that on your daily basis, and then the once a year that the priest does for the people who, who do believe, he does it for himself and the people f- every year. And that's also found in Leviticus, the Yom Kippur, which we'll talk about again a little later. So the formula I just gave you, uh, now, Dr. White again mentions about for non-Jews, yes, for foreigners or sojourners in the Old Testament, uh, there were specific guidelines guidelines for them for sacrifices, including sin offerings. So if they came and they wanted to participate in this atoning process, they would, of course, which in part uh, maintain the right relationship with the God of Israel. These guidelines were primarily directed at Israelites. However, they were pr- provisions for foreigners and sojourners, non-Israel, non-Israelites who lived among the Is- Israelite community, people who lived there to participate in the religious practice, including sin offerings. So if you were living amongst the Israels, amongst the Hebrews, you, and, and you partake in this, you would have to go through the same thing. And that's Leviticus 17 and Leviticus 22. Uh, Numbers 15 as well. So read those sections for that and you'll find out that it is not, in, that's not exclusive, but it's the inclusivity. These provisions reflect God's inclusivity, inviting non-Israelites to worship him, participate in the community's religious practices, 
provided they follow the same laws and rituals as the Israelites. And that brings the unity of the Torah, uh, assimilations in worship, and of course, prefiguring of the gospel in the New Testament, which again prefigures it that the exclusiveness can be seen as a, as a prefiguration of the gospel's message, which extends God's invitation of salvation and recon reconciliation to all people, not just the Jewish, not just Jews. So this was for the nations. This was a prefigure of, of the gospel, that the salvation, God's invitation would be extended to all through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection since he died and conquered sin and death. Everybody sins and dies. Remember, the rain falls on the wicked and the righteous. So him conquering sin and death uh, as a whole, everybody who sins and dies are invited to be reconciled with God through the Son. Everyone. It's not a universal salvation, but because of what Christ did, conquering sin and death in that category, and everybody dies and everybody sins, everyone's invited. You don't have to if you choose not to, as in the Old Testament. Your guilt is on you. The sin is on you. You will pay the price. That's what you find also in Romans. Guilty by sin. The wages of sin is death. This is a proper understanding of the Old Testament atonement process, the steps, and the new covenant that comes that now does away with the sin offerings. And he, the, the Jews, believers, and Hebrews were continuing to do this. Now, I, I know I got ahead here, but let's continue because I want you to hear what else Dr. White has to say about this and how he tries to acknowledge this elect by inserting it into the text. So, therefore he, Christ, Dunatai is able to do what? Well, the, the direct object, he is able, Sodzain, to save, <clears throat> even unto the uttermost, modifying phrase that goes with that. And then here you have, who is he able to save? The ones drawing near through him to God. So here's the first part of the sentence, is here. But then you have the second part, as a, and this is this is what, what my question was. How does this part relate to this part? And specifically, how does zone pontate, always living, ice tall with the infinitive, uh, to intercede, who pair altone? Now, altone is wrapping up what's right here, those drawing near to God through him. <clears throat> so they're the ones that are he is interceding for. But what is it about this that is related to this ability to save ice ta pantales? Okay. Now, <clears throat> this was central to my assertion. This was central to my opening statement. This is central to what Owen has said. This is central to what I wrote in the in Potter's Freedom. <clears throat> if you're going to debate me on this topic and you've had months to prepare, don't come back and say, well, I didn't know you were going to say, what an obscure text is that? Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's just, the di it's, it's in print, folks. It's documented electronically, in print, whatever else you want. It's right there. And I've already posted on Twitter what I wrote in, in Potter's Freedom. I post on Twitter just one example from the death of death and death of Christ, John Owen, I think it was pages somewhere between 30 and 32, so it was early on in the book. So th th this isn't some hidden thing. Uh, if you're gonna debate this topic, you have to be prepared to deal with this. It's been presented in the opening statement. If you cannot deal with the positive side's opening statement, you lose the debate. Okay, so I don't think that, that qualifies losing the debate again. Uh, he diagrams this portion, uh, of course, the section with having Jesus, you know, referring, being referred to as able to save from the uttermost completely the ones who come to God. Uh, I'm not sure if he, it seems like he's interpreting this as being saved from the uttermost being their depravity or who they are. Uh, again, this doesn't reflect this in the Greek. Uh, it's the ones coming, the ones coming to God through Jesus. Uh, yes, I understand the diagram. I have it in front of me. Uh, from the uttermost. Now, again, if you look at, again, Ellingsworth, Paul, the Epistle of Hebrews, he breaks this down in the Greek. 
uh, Ais tu Panteles here, the phrase, uh, which to, to the Jews, uh, those who offended against God and his Torah, as, as we see in verse 12, Hebrews, uh, and verse 10, Hebrews 10, 26, are destroyed. And of course, it's disputed how it should be understood. Some think qualitatively as a meaning completely, fully, as in the King James, or to the uttermost, as the NIV says, or J.B. Phillips and Peake and, and others, uh, you know, or temporary forever, temporarily, or temporarily forever with the Vulgate and the Syriac and Luther and Calvin and all these other translations. Um, but it's usually looked at as probably the first one uh, completely as the uh, the strongest part of the word or the way it should be found in. Also, it's found, I think, in, in Third Maccabees 7, 16 uh, in, in the Greek. It suggests uh, a more stronger uh, element of it. Uh, it. It just says Christ's priesthood is permanent. So is the salvation which makes it possible, permanent. And so... Again, looking at those from the uttermost, those it's it's a whole different context. And again, I, I, I strongly suggest you you want to look at that scholarly resource. He gives all the sources, the background behind it, uh, regarding each breakdown of this in, in the Hebrew, so you can follow along. Uh, you do need a little bit of Hebrew. Uh, I mean, sorry, in the Greek, not the Hebrew. In the Greek, he breaks down in the Greek, uh, and and he also deals with this uh, in some of this. Uh, you should, you do need to know a little bit of Greek here. Uh, or able to look it up and see for yourself what he's saying here. Um, so, again, the, the the Greek does not help Dr. White on his interpretation. Uh, as I stated earlier in the beginning, uh, that is not how you determined what it, the text is trying to say and what it doesn't say. But he's going to continue to press this, and you'll see more of it. It doesn't matter what else you say. It doesn't matter what else you throw out. If you cannot respond to their argumentation, you lose the debate. That's how it works. And so the question was, the question literally was, because you could you could argue that there's sort of a semi-break after priesthood at the end of verse 24. Um, but the, the, the sentence that forms verse 25, I'm asking... What's the relationship between the first part and the second part? It's pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Yes, it's pretty straightforward, but again, he's making more than what it is. He's actually, uh, this, is, this is his attempt to, to me, uh, you know, kind of do a little bit of a red herring, uh, a little bit of misdirection, uh, blow this up. The, the only connection is that the ones who come to God through Jesus, that is the ones that he's making intercessions for, them. Them who? The ones that Jesus is able to save completely, the ones who come to God through him. cross reference John 14, 6 for this and other passages. Through him, through the Son. So you know in John 6 it says through the Father, you know, to the Son. It's kind of reverse order here, but here it's now through Jesus to get to the Father, which you find in Gospel of John as well. Um, and then, of course, no one can come to the Father except through Him, only able Father who draws Him. And here now you go to the Son, to the Father, <clears throat> because this is dealing with the mediator, the priest, the eternal priest, Jesus. He's, you don't need the priest now in the temple who dies and can't forgive sin with their sacrifice. It's not there. So now we have this understanding that, that that's all the connection it is. That is literally all it is saying. Anything more than that is just adding to Jesus, adding your interpretation, a reform theology. And not even myself would use this text to, to support free will. I mean, I can build a case on it like I did with the Old Testament and all that, and then come and say this this helps it. But the, the verse itself doesn't say, again, like I said before, it doesn't it doesn't tell you um, you know, who the specific group is, which Walker White says the elect, or if it's deter determined some other way, free will. The interpretive question of whether this action is available to all or, or only a specific group is not determined by the Greek. This is, an, this is, uh, is inclusive and action-oriented, focusing on the continual act in approaching God through Jesus. So it is inclusive of saying the ones who come to God the ones who come to God, that is that is what we need to focus on. Um, you know, the ones who come, the ones who come to God, uh, and that is, of course, 
the, the, from the Greek, you know, tos preskamenos de atu, the ones coming toward. Now, now, of course, in the Greek, you know, this is also this word uh, coming from uh, with even with uh, preskamenos, uh, which is also dealt with again in the uh, Ellingsworth work here, um, dealing with also possibly this word is also used in other writings outside the New Testament. Um, and it's also used in a way of coming from afar, uh, you know, how, how the coming is directed here. Um, so w the approach indicates a reverence, um, but not directly in the presence of God, but from like a, from afar. Uh, so the, the verb is, is, is has an approach indicates more of a reverence to God, uh, an approach to God in worship, uh, that type of thing. And that tells you the verb is used in other uh, outside texts. Um, as well as in the New Testament, uh, in the Old Testament as well, Exodus sixteen nine, we can look at John six thirty seven, ten nine, John fourteen six, First Peter two four, uh, and how the verb in other areas how this works of coming to God in worship and, and, and coming from afar, and also Ephesians two thirteen. So you've got to do this and look at all the different aspects of how this needs to be interpreted, not the way Dr. White is doing it by simply appealing to his Greek diagram and mainly on his Reformed Calvinistic interpretation. But again, let's continue listening. Forward. And my argument is he is able to save to the uttermost because he ever lives to make intercession for them. The intercessory work of the high priest enables him to save to the uttermost, and that means his work as the high priest is in behalf of Huper Hamon, those for whom he is interceding. You see, he Jason's got it backwards. <clears throat> he says, our faith then allows Christ to intercede for us. The reality is, his intercession with the Father is what saves us. It's not our fulfilling conditions. And now we've fulfilled a condition. Now he can intercede for us. The condition is that we are in him. They're the ones, we are the only ones who draw near to God through him. Because we have been united with him. There really isn't any concept within provisionism of the reality of our union with Christ in the reality of his death. We only become united with Christ when we believe. So again, it's always from time trying to extend up to look at what happens in heaven rather than recognizing there is the eternal and there is the temporal. And again, <clears throat> again, false assumptions here. Um, his interpretation, again, does not give him Calvinism. Well, actually, his interpretation, his interpretation does, but the, 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 the interpretation, the, the text itself in the Greek does not give that interpretation within Calvinism. <clears throat> his interpretation does, obviously, because it's his interpretation. But again, the, the emphasis on saving from the uttermost, dealing with, to them, that's the elect. It doesn't say that. It's not what it's saying in the Greek. Uh, he's actually interpreting it that way, but... It, that is not how it is understood. And again, most commentaries that are non-Calvin commentaries from well-known scholars do not interpret it that way. So I think it's, it's disingenuous of him and very misleading to, to try and enforce that into the text uh, where, it, again, he is, again, he, Jesus, is able to save completely the ones who come to God through him, Jesus, because there they're going to the high priest. And again, as we saw in the Old Testament, it was something you had to acknowledge of your sin yourself or, or you pay the price of guilt. So you have to recognize that, come to the priest. And they were, they were not going to Jesus. They were not relying on Jesus. They were relying on the priest. So those who is able to save completely, fully, the ones who come to God through him, since why? He always lives to make intercession for who? The ones who come to God through Jesus. And again, it's clear in the Greek. It doesn't give each side, it doesn't tell you how they're coming or for what, it doesn't give you the reason behind it. What Dr. White does this diagram, which does not give him his interpretation, he's implying 
implying, I say, that the God saves from the uttermost uh, through intercession for all those things, the ones who come to him as the elect. And you that is not, in fact, in his book, he, he even makes this point. And I'll read from his book. He says, as we have seen, the Arminian says God decrees to save, but leaves the identity of who will be saved to the free choice of human beings. They might be tempted to insert this overriding concern into this passage, as well as point to the fact that Jesus saves those who draw near to God through him. Obviously, drawing near to God involves an act of free will, would be the assertion. And, and I'm going to stop there, and I'd say it's not the assertion, it's what could, what could be understood by the text itself, with everything else I mentioned of the Old Testament, the Atonement, and even partially in here, in the book of Hebrews, which we'll see. This was not an assertion. But White continues, um, again, placing the first power of choice in the hands of the sinner. But, of course, we have already seen that Jesus taught that no man is able to exercise this kind of coming unless it is granted by the Father, John 6, 44. Uh, John 6, 44, I think he meant to say it, went through 65. So, he's now relying on his interpretation based on his, his interpretation of John 6. So, listen to what he's doing here. His refutation of the Armenian view or the free will view is quoting back to John 6 and Romans 8, of course. Uh, no one seeks after God, so forth, in Romans 8 and all these other. But he's doing the exact same thing. Uh, he's reading into the text the elect, which is not there, or any kind of uh, even discrimination uh, description of an elect in that group, a particular group of an elect. It's not in the text. So he's relying on his other interpretations that we've already discussed that are completely faulty to give him this interpretation. That is not exegesis. If you have, if you're looking at another text that you, you you could get that doesn't even expressly say what you're saying in another text, and you're applying it to this text, and you're doing it to all these texts, you're just you're just stringing along text that you're thinking hope support your position, but there's nothing in the text to give you that conclusion from doing proper exegesis. That's, you're stringing along text, single verses to make a picture. You're relying on Greek, which does not give you that interpretation. And then you're inserting into the Greek, your position of elect and all these other things. That's what White does. And he's continuing to do it here. So let's continue and see how he continues to do this. We experience in time only that which reflects what has been done in reality in eternity. So <clears throat> I was united with Christ before I existed. And if God does not have a divine decree and perfect knowledge of the fu future, that, that's an absurd statement, but Scripture plainly teaches that he does. <clears throat> and so the, the elect were united with Christ in his death. My name is graven on his hand. Don't sing that song if you're a provisionist. No provisionist can sing before the throne of God can't do it you're lying and you know it can't do it you don't believe your name was great when i was in so this verse needs to be understood you need to be able to explain because i had presented this as being vital to then transitioning into new covenant new better mediator better promises chapter a Forgiveness of sins, right law upon the heart. Into chapter 9, he enters into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Chapter 10, once for all, no longer have a reminder of sins. Instead, we have a reminder of the sin bearer. We are perfected by the one will rather than the preceding will. Uh, the one sacrifice of Christ. I mean, this is it's the gospel. And this is really the longest continuous contiguous uh, section in all of scripture that talks about the atoning work of Christ there isn't anything longer than what you have in the book of Hebrews which I've argued is why most people don't have a biblical doctrine of atonement they have an emotional doctrine of atonement because Hebrews is not the favorite book of a whole lot of evangelicals today <clears throat> so there you've got the background there's there you see it. Um, de -de 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 -de. There we go. Okay, so he's going <clears> to <throat> discuss some other things here that's not really relevant uh, to, at least I don't think so. You can watch his whole video. Uh, I'll leave a link here. 
But again, understanding the Greek, uh, he, t- he talked a lot. I think he mentioned also about the infinitive verb uh, used, uh, of course, in 725 uh, to intercede. And I think it's necessary um, to understand uh, the present active infinitive form of the Greek uh, in this in this in this section of coming to. Or, or I'm sorry, making intercession or pleading on the behalf um, at Tekenanin, uh, and then it goes to Uparaton. So in this, this is a present active infinitive, okay, that, which again is the one uh, to intervene, to intercede, approaching on the behalf or, or to appeal to present infinitive, which it, all it's doing is suggesting an ongoing continuous action. That's all it's saying here. That's all the present active infinitive is referring to, the, an ongoing continuous action. Okay, that's all it's referring to. So when we see this, and then of course, uh, we look at the word huper, which is a, a preposition that means on behalf of, or for the sake of, and all it's doing is indicating that the action of the verb is performed in the interest or for the benefit of someone else, which is, in the next, the last one, auton. And that's the pronoun. Of course, it's in the genitive plural, and it's it's referring to their as to them, or on their behalf to them, and it refers to the people on whose behalf the, inter- the intercession is made. So putting it all together, um, it's all it's referring to is, is to intercede on behalf of them, or to continually intercede for their sake. Who the believers? The key points of the Greek to the believers: continuous action, uh, active role of the intercessor, and the beneficiaries of the intercession. So, all it's saying from the broader argument, the broad, what Paul is saying, uh, he's communicating here the assurance of salvation and the permanence of Jesus' priesthood. As the eternal high priest, Jesus is continually interceding with God on behalf of believers, not the elect, believers. Now, if you want to call believers the elect, by all means, but not the way Calvinists interpret elect, obviously, um, for us, we say the, the elect is, are the people who come to God, put their faith in Christ, trust in him, and now they have access to the Father through their eternal high priest, and he's always making intercessing for them as believers. But it's an open invitation. It's inclusive, not exclusive. And the ongoing intercession is a key aspect of the new covenant, signifying the complete, complete and perfect mediation between Jesus in the contrast to the repeated and ultimately insufficient sacrifices under the old covenant as we just saw. So when you break it down, that's what all you're going to get. Uh, again, we can look at a present active infinitive verbs like sozin, to save. We can look at eis uh, pantelis completely or utterly. Uh, denatai is able. I mean, you can look at this, those who come, present middle participles. We can look, but it doesn't give you the interpretation. It doesn't tell you how the action is being performed or, or in what way. That is not what it's giving you. Um, those who come through him to God, always living. I mean, you can look at all these things and it's not going to give you that interpretation. Um, this is why I have a problem with how Dr. White reads and interprets the Greek because it's really one-dimensional here um, and it's not being honest on how this sh- could be understood, uh, there's nothing in the Greek that is that is, is able to give you th- whether the action is available. Well, it, th- the question is: is specific group of the elect how they're coming and what act in what way doesn't specify how how God is doing it or if He's doing it or if it's some if they're coming on their own free will. We can determine that it is inclusive, as in the Old Testament we just saw, building that case from the Old Testament sacrificial system, that those who recognize their sin, their guilt, and all that will bring their offering freely and have to do it. If they don't, they can be outcast, put to death, all those things as a result for not bringing it. And same thing here. They're bringing offerings. They're bypassing the Messiah. These Jewish believers in the historical context are continuing to go to the high priest's and have a second high priest who cannot forgive sin, take away, and they're ignoring the, the eternal high priest, Jesus, who will continue to make intercessions. These are believers coming to offer sacrifice again and again and again. And the, the, the Paul is appealing to is that 
you who come to God through Jesus will always have intercession from Jesus to God directly on your behalf continually forever. You who come to God. The ones who come to God, these are the believers. The Jewish believe they're already believers. They're all part of, part of the body who continually to do these things and trample the under the foot and trample the head of the, well in, in, in Hebrews ten, trampling the foot of God uh, under the foot of God. Uh making that point. Uh, make, make, uh uh, trampled, trampled under the foot of the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant which by he has sanctified and has, uh, and has insulted the spirit of grace. So how much severe punishment to you, th- to, to you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot of the Son of God and, and so forth. So you're continually to, to, to in your sins, you're continually to bring these uh, outside to the priest rather than leaving it in the hands of the eternal high priest. So this verse does not help Dr. White at all, as we have seen through the Old Testament. We have seen through outside sources. There was an idea of uh, from Philo, and I don't think Paul is, uh, you know, saying what Philo is saying, but there was, as Dr. White said, there wasn't. There was an idea of the priest giving, for different reasons, uh, these offerings for the world and all humanity, and it's not for salvation, obviously. But it's for different reasons why they did it. Salvation; These were already Jewish believers in salvation coming to God, not through Christ, Jesus only, but through the high priest who was already at the temple. And I think this was, again, could be pressured from the Jews, could be, you know, having been told you have to do this or you, or you, maybe they'd be outcast or persecuted if they, if they would continue to give sacrifices, even if they were believers or not. Um, I think they might have tried to hide that they were believers, maybe bringing these offerings and, and secretly they are believers and, and Paul saying, why are you still doing this? Again, Hebrews outlines the whole thing and then it goes into the covenant and all that and how these offerings don't remove sin. Um, and we find that in, throughout history, uh, Jewish believers have always been persecuted by their own people for believing in Yeshua Jesus as their Messiah. And sometimes they would be excommunicated. They weren't allowed to live in those communities. So it, this could be a reason why they... They were continuing to do this. But again, it does not say what White says. I'm sorry, but you cannot get that interpretation. And this is what, I guess, caught me here because I know Jason is not, you know, I know he's not a linguist or anything, a linguist, uh, not in that means, or a scholar in that, and I get it. Uh, and Dr. White is kind of taking advantage of that. Um, and I think that's wrong. But Jason did a good job anyway, and he held his own to the point where he needed to. Where proper to Jesus, you can yes, he could have answered and said to them, the ones to come. And of course, uh, I think I, I would have pressed and said, but the text doesn't say how they are coming, in what way, at all. Uh, it's inclusive and action oriented, focusing on the continual act of approaching God through Jesus. That's what it's trying to say. The interpretive question on whether this action is available to all or only specific group like the elect is determined by more of a theological perspective. The Greek emphasizes the action and its means through Jesus without explicit, explicitly limiting the scope of who can undertake the sect of this action. But the context is Jewish believers continually coming to offer. So these were already believers and, and Paul is dealing with those believers and he's saying to them, trying to correct them, saying Jesus saves completely. Those who come to God through him he always lives to make an intercession for those who come to God. And he saves, he completely saves them. You can say from the uttermost if you want, but it's more likely completely. And so you have to insert this understanding. So again, I hope that you got a lot out of this. I know I've gone an hour here, probably longer than I usually go, but I think this was important to understand what's tr- what is being uh, mishandled in the sense of proper exegesis. It's not being dealt with correctly here. Uh, I think I'll be, I know Jason reached out to me about coming on in in a discussion group and and discussing more of this in detail. So I plan on doing that. I do have a lot of notes in case we have to go deeper into the Greek here. We can look at the Hebrew and the Aramaic if we need to. Uh, I don't think you need to Septuagint at this point because it's Hebrew scriptures that Paul would be referencing here. And that gives you the answer. So I want to say thank you for tuning in. Uh, Thank you. Like, subscribe. If you have a comment, please leave the questions here. 
Uh, like and subscribe, share. But I say thank you, God bless, and have a wonderful day. Bible Answers with Dr. Al Garza.